The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, it's smart enough to learn to adapt and use its environment, and so it's kind of a neat little bird in that way. Everybody has a part to play in the recovery of the monarch. Oh, look at monarch right here. Planting flowers in a garden is a great start. Setting up a tent can be intimidating, or just spending the night in a park. That is a brand new experience for a lot of folks. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Well, there's a nest right over there. Sprinkler spraying right into it. Like cool them off at least. Oh yeah, there's one above the nest. Oh yeah, look at that. These birds are loggerhead shrikes. And despite the occasional unplanned shower, this city park in Round Rock, Texas, has turned out to be a pretty good place to build a nest. Here comes the sprinkler hitting them again. This is a 570 acre park in a very urbanized area and there's at least 14 different pairs with young. It's not necessarily the ideal place as far as we're concerned. It's uh, managed for recreational purposes and it's in a suburban community, but there's something about it that they like. The loggerhead in the bird's name refers to its fairly large head in relation to the rest of the body. The loggerhead shrike is unusual in that it's a songbird with a raptor's habits. Its diet consists of bugs and insects, but it also eats lizards, snakes, mice, and even other songbirds. One of the things that it has is a, a hook bill. When they capture their prey, they catch it on the back like a lion in the savanna, and pull it down and then bite at the neck to paralyze their prey. Then the shrike will do something that is really interesting. It impales its meal on something sharp, like a thorn or barbed wire. Their feet aren't strong enough to hold on to it and tear it apart like a raptor would, so they put it on thorns so that the thorn can hold the food and they can use their bill to get pieces to feed their young. Kind of a story of uh, brains versus brawn. Uh, it's smart enough to learn to adapt and use its environment, and so it's kind of a neat little bird in that way. Jim Giacomo came to this park looking for scissor tail flycatchers. What he found was a lot of loggerhead shrikes. They're a common bird that's in serious decline. They're, they're declining by 6% a year in this area. So there are eggs. They're listed as endangered in Canada. They span across all of North America down into Mexico. They're one of the many grassland birds that are in trouble right now. Trouble for the loggerhead shrike and many grassland bird species comes in the form of habitat changes. Jim is with the Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture, which is a partnership of government agencies and private groups working to address habitat loss and restoration for grassland birds. As humans, we're really good at either clearing out the land or uh, letting everything grow up and get overgrown with shrubs. And these birds kind of need something in the middle. They need the, the low grass, but they also need the scattered trees within the fields for nest sites. So a number of these grassland species are in a serious decline, but one of the nice things about these type of birds is they respond well to management. Uh, and so when we've got landowners out there doing the right things, providing the right kind of habitat, we can see increases in the population uh, pretty quickly. Heck of a start. While the folks with the Oaks and Prairies joint venture are out there working with landowners to improve habitat for grassland birds, these loggerhead shrikes have made this urban park their home. It's the short grass, scattered trees where they can find perches, plenty of areas to forage around those trees. They've had to come to places like this that are providing the habitat they need, but maybe less than ideal when we think about it from a, a larger scale. And those scissor tail flycatchers that Jim had originally hoped to find? Well, 
they too have settled in at Old Settlers Park. There's something about this park that provides the right structure for them, really, and it provides the kind of habitat that they're looking for. It's just kind of hit a sweet spot for them, and they, they obviously like this area. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program. On a side note here, we'd like to discourage you from sticking your smartphone or your camera or anything into an active bird's nest. You risk the parents abandoning the nest and it could be considered harassment of wildlife. So leave the research and the photography to the professionals. Rising from the flat Texas wetlands along the Houston Ship Channel, it is one of the most recognizable symbols of Texas history. A soaring monument to commemorate a small battle with huge consequences that took place upon this field in 1836. Mexico's President Santa Ana and his army had come to Texas, a part of Mexico at the time, to put an end to the revolution for Texas independence. After massacres at the Alamo and Goliad, Santa Ana and his soldiers marched in pursuit of Sam Houston and the Texan troops. The two forces met on the open fields of San Jacinto. The Mexican troops were relaxing, comfortable in knowing they had 1,300 trained soldiers to Sam Houston's 750 untrained troops. The afternoon attack by the smaller Texas Army on April 21, 1836 was unexpected, taking the Mexican Army completely by surprise. 18 minutes later, the Mexican army was in disarray. The victory secured Texas independence. This monument was built to be a memorial to remind us of the sacrifices of all those who fought for Texas independence. And when people come here, they see that singular vision in this San Jacinto monument. Dedicated on San Jacinto Day in 1939, the builders of the monument invented techniques designed on the spot that are still in use by construction companies today. At 567 feet above the battleground, the Guinness Book of World Records lists the structure as the tallest monumental column in the world. We have utilized every square foot of this building. We currently have a working research center for those who would like to learn about the wonderful history of this state. We also have a gallery full of exhibits which reflect the artifacts and documents of that time. We also have one of the best historical interpretations in our theater for Texas studies. The U.S. Constitution it was widely endorsed. From the observation floor, Visitors can view the rich tapestry of the Texas coastal area, including restored wetlands, the battleship Texas, and the sacred battleground. The monument really honors both sides of the, the battle, both Mexico and Texas. Uh, and of course, independence won for Texas from Mexico at this site. And so what, what better site to have this magnificent monument erected to honor all of those individuals? Since about 1990, there's been a group of assorted living historians who have assembled on the Saturday closest to San Jacinto Day, April 21, to reenact the Battle of San Jacinto. We'd invite you to come in. It's a free to the public, and it's just a, a wonderful tapestry of color and sound and, and smells. This place embodies the hopes and dreams of people like Sam Houston and Lorenzo de Zavala, Lamar, Sidney Sherman, these are the people that led the way for Texas today. Can y'all see it? The branch kind of comes over. Oh, right there he's just moving, oh, yeah. You. It's October in the Rio Grande Valley. Just check this one. These folks have come from near and far to the Edinburgh Wetlands World Birding Center. Let's go. To appreciate a wealth of flying colors. Right there 
It's teensy. They just spotted a second U.S. record. But these nature tourists aren't here for the birds. Never seen it in the U.S. The flying things they're after are butterflies. And this is just one stop on the annual Texas Butterfly Festival. Okay, good. South Texas is like heaven to birders. Uh, it's also pretty spectacular for butterflies. Here we have a skipper. You can see more species of butterflies. White peacock. Than anywhere else in the United States. Oh yeah. It's just another aspect of the, the wildlife watching that's so fantastic here in the valley. This is the malachite that we saw earlier. It uh, brings attention to uh, nature uh, and is also a great economic support for our community. The popularity of chasing butterflies is a fairly new phenomenon. Another one. Butterfly field guides didn't really start coming out until the mid-90s, I guess. And like birding, you eventually start checking them off a list and that sort of thing. These tropical ones have been seen at the park. Butterflies are really birders that have gone over to the dark side. It's, it's just a progression. Right here. Today I found four or five lifers, butterflies I've never seen before, and it's a great, great thrill. Butterfly watching also draws those who just want to relax and enjoy some of nature's small wonders. You just can't help but be interested in it. I think they're beautiful. I just like the colors. They're so pretty and they're so fragile and short-lived. Though fragile indeed, one particular butterfly is known for its epic annual migration. Right up on top. Monarch. The monarch. Each fall, millions of monarchs funnel through Texas from as far north as Canada en route to their wintering sites in central Mexico. Along this central flyway, monarchs can be seen in flight or taking rest stops along the way. There was a bunch of them. Catching sight of a monarch roost is something that landowners like Dobb and Kay Cunningham look forward to. It's always a big thrill when they start coming in. This part of Texas is kind of plain but there is a beauty in this country that you have to be patient and wait for, and the monarchs are one of those. I didn't know they were so unique and complicated, and it is quite a phenomenon. That these delicate insects can fly up to 3,000 miles and somehow converge on the same patch of mountains in Mexico is one of the miracles of nature. One of the most unique migrations that I've ever heard of. But the miraculous monarch migration is in trouble. We still have masses of them. They're still coming, but not near the numbers. It brings joy to me to, to see them coming in great distress when I think the numbers have fallen. What Texas ranchers have noticed has been confirmed by surveys. The numbers that are returning back to Mexico have declined considerably. Monarch numbers have dropped to a fraction of those recorded when monitoring began in the early 1990s. While there are concerns about illegal logging and cold snaps impacting wintering monarchs, their biggest challenges may be those they face on their return in the spring and their dependence on a single plant for reproduction. During the spring migration, we're not too aware of it. We're, we don't see them in masses the way we see them in the fall. But that's when it's critical because they're returning from Mexico, they're trying to lay eggs, and the only host plant is uh, milkweed or Asclepias. Because it's an international animal, you know, Canada, the United States, and Mexico, there are so many variables. We can help Texas lead the efforts in the recovery of the monarch butterfly. As part of a tri-national restoration effort, Texas Parks and Wildlife has launched a native pollinator conservation plan. Everybody has a part to play in the recovery of the monarch, and that's the beauty of it. It doesn't matter whether you live in the city, in the country. Uh, you can help restore habitat. It's decisions we make. Planting flowers in a garden is a great start. The best we can do is to be thoughtful about how we manage land and, you know, do we need to mow all the milkweed? Do we, you know, do we cut down all the flowers in the fall in the roadside ditches, or do we, you know, leave some things for those butterflies that are coming back through? And I think the more we understand that, the more we'll we'll be able to do our part. Look, there's a couple of milkweed bugs on the backside of this. Park interpreter Craig Hensley is certainly doing his part. Craig oversees volunteers who monitor milkweed, monarchs, and other butterflies each spring at Guadalupe River State Park. 
Isn't that a gorgeous butterfly? Oh, look at Monarch right here, right there. Today is one of our butterfly surveys. Have you seen any eggs or larvae? No. We also monitor a patch of milkweed in the park uh, for the Monarch Larval Monitoring Project. Don't you get that one, I'll, I'll get, get this, this one. one right. We count milkweeds, look for monarch eggs. We're just coming out of a drought and our milkweed has been low, so we're really excited because we're seeing more and more stopping here and they are laying eggs. Here it is, right here. Oh, cool. A lot of people feel if they follow the monarch that they get a, an idea about the health of the whole ecosystem. These are arrivals from Mexico. They're kind of beat up. Yeah. You know, you start looking at the natural world and you see declines in bumblebee populations and, and other native pollinator populations. You see what's happening with the honeybee. And All right, let's go out to the patch. You realize that, you know, there's a delicate balance of the natural world. And so that's the monarch egg. It's amazing how much of that balance focuses on very, very tiny little insects that, that we are uh, highly dependent upon. Without them, we have potentially a lot less food in our grocery stores and it probably costs a lot more. So the picture of the monarch is a bigger picture of pollinators in general. A lot to learn about monarchs in Texas um, as they pass through north and south. Let's keep going. Though focused on the big picture, for Craig, hey, this is also personal. Did you get the two monarch adults? I have two grandchildren, and um, I don't want them to grow up without the chance to see a monarch butterfly. And my fear is that that possibility exists. I think the world becomes a lesser place if we watch things like the monarch disappear or become rare. Golly, look at that right there. Oh. These are gorgeous little animals. and if we could just see another hundred of them. And a great gateway animal, for, for especially for kids getting into nature. How many? A lot. A lot. Next spring when she gets back Back on the border, Texas, Carol Culler also uses monarchs to introduce kids to nature. So if you'll put your finger up in the air, you don't want to? At first, they're a little afraid of having it touch their finger. And by the end of the presentation, they all want you to put the butterfly on their finger. You ready? OK. And they all want to say bye to Monarch and let Ooh, it go. Whoa. Carol participates in a citizen's science project, tagging monarchs during fall migration. This little tag then traces where that butterfly came from, One, eight, seven. what day it was tagged, how many miles that it's flown down to Mexico. There he goes, okay. happy trails. We yeah. don't have all the answers. We don't know every detail of this process. We do get a lot of data just from that one tag. There's a soldier right in front of you there. So amazing. Meanwhile, just downriver, the Texas Butterfly Festival wraps up with a splash of color at Falcon State Park. <laughs> oh, awesome. I've never seen anything like this. We've seen well over 100 species here in this garden over a three-day period. I've seen more butterflies in one day than I've seen in my whole life put together. A lot of butterflies. Among the bounty of butterflies Thanks, Ma. and one fancy moth it's a beautiful one. are also many monarchs gassing up the butterfly garden before heading to Mexico. When he opens out, it looks like a little jet plane. Our manager wanted to do some landscaping in the park. I said, well, why not? Let's make a butterfly garden. It grew and grew and grew. Till now we have about an acre of plants, all native right here to this area. It's been successful beyond our wildest imaginations. Whether by planting milkweed or other native flowering plants. See the white bar on the wing? Whether by studying butterflies or just appreciating them. Better angle from over here. Watching out for these colorful insects is something anyone can do. There she goes. Building that awareness Bye. will hopefully make a difference. In return, butterflies just might remind us life is fragile and amazing with much to admire in the smallest details. They're really awesome animals. Kids spend approximately seven hours a day with electronic media and seven minutes a day playing outside. That's something we need to change for the future generations so that they appreciate the outdoors, appreciate parks, and want to come back and spend time here.
Texas Outdoor Family is a very unique program. We are bringing out beginner families to the outdoors and having them connect with nature through outdoor recreation. A combination of education, recreation, makes these real personal connections. The first thing we do when the families arrive is we teach them base camp setup. So how to set up their tent, how to use all of the equipment, the stoves, the pots, the pans, and then we talk about leave no trace. And there's a lot of fear around spending time in the outdoors. How do we help them overcome that barrier and teach them that not everything in nature is scary uh, and that it's more about respecting nature and understanding it. Setting up a tent can be intimidating to a lot of people or just spending the night in a park. That is a brand new experience for a lot of folks. And without the guidance from a park ranger or the help with some equipment to get them there and get them through the weekend, it can be intimidating. So that's where the outdoor family comes in. We'll go from base camp and setup of, of tents uh, into a lot of different uh, fun day activities, including kayaking, mountain biking. They love it if they catch a fish. <laughs> if they catch a fish, they're really excited. First one ever. It's a pretty cool fish, Aiden. <laughs> Geocaching. Uh, they love to find the hidden treasure in the woods, so it, it varies by kid, but they, they love every bit of it. At night, we do night programs, so sounds of the night, night hikes, uh, as well as stargazing programs. Is that really Jupiter? Yes. Sounds of the night program, that's kind of my favorite I love doing, where we actually explain what they're hearing out in the tents. Again, remember, kind of scary situation for the first night, so we alleviate that through education. We've reached the most families we've ever reached. By the end of this weekend, we'll be over a thousand families have camped with us, and, and that's exciting. We're reaching more and more people and getting them the opportunity to spend time outside. It's very rewarding when I have the kids in there helping me with the Junior Ranger program, and I'm seeing they're getting it. They're connecting with the resources that we're trying to show them. They're making these connections to the wonderful resources all around the state as well. It's really a neat experience to see the kids' faces light up. <coughs> to think that they're gonna grow up and be like, yeah, I went camping and I can do that again and I wanna do it again and go home and ask their mom and dad, hey, can we go camping again? That's what I love.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels. Over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.